Lindy, it's going to be hard to follow this today. <laughs> what a fun, surprising morning it has been already, and we're only just beginning the service. But now that Robin Frazier is here, we can begin the service. You bring love and delight into our presence. Thank you. Actually, we have several uh, guests here today, so um, we'll greet you in a moment, but I'll give you my greeting now. Getting to know you, that beautiful song that kind of supports me and my alter ego, which is Broadway. And we actually have a little song in the lesson today, but that's another matter. I welcome all of you to Unity South Twin Cities on this beautiful summer day. Get ready for a good time. I'll give you a little spoiler now that should be an announcement time, but we have beautiful refreshments downstairs for a time of socializing, enjoying one another's company, and some delightful things to eat. Adam has brought us homemade hummus. There's fresh fruit, all kinds of goodies down there. So please, even if you don't want to eat right now, you have other plans, at least come down and greet one another, for this is our first social time since March 15th, 2020. Just a year and a half. So the party will continue after the service. For those of you joining us online, Facebook Live or YouTube, please send us your name and location so that we can know you are with us and we can greet you through that wonderful technology. For those present in our sanctuary, please silence your phones and other devices so we can have a peaceful atmosphere here in the sanctuary. Today, our music director, Judy Moen, always cooks up surprises for me, and she's joined by a very old friend, uh, Jim Tenbensel, on his, what did you tell me, large trumpet or trombone? <laughs> I didn't know that's what trombone meant. So we learn something new every day, and they will join us. Our tech team today is Don Ramler on the uh, cameras, and Adam on the sound, and Patty's just laying back and enjoying the service today, so that's wonderful. Um, I'm missing something, but hopefully it'll come up by announcement time. So I invite you now to let's bring our attention to a focus, to gather in our collective intention what this service is all about is to acknowledge the presence of the all good, the almighty, our very source of life and substance. Let us pray. Holy, 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 spirit everlasting, the source of all creation and all that is behind creation, we acknowledge with reverence and give our joyful thanks for your presence here now always. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. You have brought forth all life out of your wisdom, love, and substance. We turn to your perfect idea of being the Christ as our guide on life's journey. Wherever we are on our path of discovery, we know we are not alone, for Christ enfolds us in love and we, in turn, hold all others in human compassion. Heaven and earth are expressions of your love. As we grow in our understanding of heaven and earth, use us to bring forth ever greater good through all our thoughts, words, and actions. You have empowered us each and all with wisdom to be your creative agents on earth. Heaven and earth, manifest your wisdom. We are willing to serve our world as we cherish all realms of life. This is your world, your gift, your very presence and power. 
to know you and honor you, we must care for spirit always and everywhere expressing. Let us now join in one mind, one heart, one voice as we speak our statement of being together. There is but one presence and one power in my life, in this church, and in the universe, God, the omnipotent good. And so it is, and we say, Amen. Now let us join in bringing a musical touch to our intention as we sing Surely the Presence. pleasure once again to invite Lindy Anderson, a real anchor of this church, to the platform to help me continue. Well, good morning again, and I welcome you to Unity South Twin Cities, whether you are watching online or seated in our sanctuary. We welcome visitors joining in person or online for the first time. Let us greet them by affirming together. We welcome you, we bless you, and we're glad you're here. <clears throat> for our joyous gathering today, let us hold this thought. I behold the Christ in you. Please join me in saying that together. I behold the Christ in you. Throughout this week, remember your unity community and hold a silent blessing for each one who calls Unity South home. We acknowledge the global human family and the diversity of religious experiences. Let us give thanks for seekers everywhere who turn their attention Godward as we give thanks for the one spirit abiding in us all. We offer this blessing to everyone as we speak Namaste, which means the sacred in me greets the sacred in you. Now returning our focus to our ministry, please join me in saying our Unity South centering statement with focus thought and warmth of feeling. Together, centered in God, assured by faith, and prospered by divine love, we boldly move forward to serve humanity by building our lives and Unity South Church together. One quick announcement, if you look in the lobby, there is a new sign-up sheet for the flea market. We've only got a couple weeks to go, so we're getting busy with our final plans, but this is to help us during that day with setup and concessions perhaps. Um, we need someone just to kind of be around if anything is needed and clean up. So there is a check off for what you would like to do or able to do. So please look at that today. And again, please sign up if you're going to be doing online um, furniture sales or 
have a table by next Sunday. Thank you. Speaking of next Sunday, please join us as Reverend Stacy begins a new lesson series based on the wisdom of the Bible. Reading the Bible again for the first time. Marcus Borg wrote a book by this title to awaken people to the many layers of meaning that can be found in the treasures of the Bible. Let's explore, as unity has done from its beginning, and place ourselves in the middle of these enduring narratives. We'll discover, discover new depth of meaning for our own life stories. Judy Moan, Holly Circle, and Jimmy Steffen will be our musicians, and Carol Moan will be our service assistant. Now let us prepare for a time of community prayer as I read the Daily Word for July 25th. The Daily Word for today is journey. My life's journey begins and ends in the heart of God. I feel excitement at the beginning of a journey, thinking about the adventures, the beautiful sights, and the fascinating people I will find at my journey's end. Even as I look forward to reaching my destination, however, I remain alert and open to the adventures and insights that await discovery along the way. My faith tells me that my spiritual journey began in the heart of God long before my human birth. In childhood, I looked outward, longing for the adventures that would become waypoints on my journey to maturity. Now I journey inward, longing for the spiritual home I never really left. I am learning that even the most ordinary day can become an opportunity to realize that the heart of God is present everywhere. From Psalm 121, verse 8. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time on and forevermore. Let's take a moment and reflect on journey. My life's journey begins and ends in the heart of God. Amen. And now I invite our chaplain, Yvette Trotman, who will guide our community prayer. Good morning, Unity South family, here and online. As we prepare our minds and hearts for the power of prayer, please know that the prayers of silent unity are with you today. We pray daily, knowing that living in awareness of God at all times is Unity's mission. United in our oneness with God and one another, we elevate our thoughts to match divine mind and infinite possibilities. We lift up all concerns, ours and others. Those who have prayers in our prayer box and those of us in the community we pray to the highest truth that we can realize the wholeness and well-being and fulfillment. As we prepare to receive God's presence during our prayer journey this morning, I invite you to still your mind and body as you sit quietly 
uncomfortably in the space of your choosing, softly and gently. Close your eyes or soften your gaze. Relax your shoulders. Focus your attention on the warmth of your breath. Use that breath and warmth as a centering device. As you quiet your thoughts, remove any outside distractions during the sacred moment with a deep cleansing breath. As you inhale and exhale. We begin today in peace by preparing our minds and hearts for the power of prayer with another deep cleansing breath. As we begin our community prayer today, we acknowledge the prayers in our prayer box. We acknowledge any of you present for any special prayer requests, for those of us also that are present online. Father, Mother, God, our silent prayer affirms peace is my center. I am calm and I am serene. In the center of my being is peace, deep, deep spiritual peace. I retreat into God. I retreat into my inner being and I uncover the steady, sure, serene connection to all that is important to me. My hopes and intentions are imbued with peace. I am peace. As I pray, <clears throat> peace is my center. I am calm and serene. Today I give myself the gift of serenity. I take a few precious moments out of my day to immerse myself in this peace journey. I take a few precious moments to mentally and physically step away from all activities and quietly turn within. I take a few precious moments to allow my senses to take in the serene stillness of peace as I become one with the silence. In these very precious and sacred moments, I feel peace at my center. I feel calm and serene in God's love through the Christ, the divine perfection within me. I feel cradled and loved with the undeniable sense of security and safety. My heart is serene. Father, Mother, God, complete in this time of prayer, we say amen. You know that as our word of prayer ends, or living of the truth realized in prayer begins. Guide us to be poised, ready, and receptive to receive that blessing as we affirm it with the singing of the Lord's Prayer.
And uh, I play the trombone. But also this morning, I'm going to invite you to sing a little bit with me because I think the model for Christian living is that you don't have to sit there and wear a frown. <laughs> In fact, you can be a clown and spread a little mirth. So here's our example of that. Uh, just give me any note. I'll play it in B-flat later, but right now just... Uh, when you're smiling... When you're smiling, yeah, the whole world smiles with you, and you, and you, and you, and you. And when you're laughing, that's your cue. <laughs> when you're laughing, the sun comes shining through. But when you're crying, <laughs> you bring on the rain. Oh, well, let's cry a little bit. We need some rain, right? <laughs> Stop your sighing. Be happy, I say. Be happy again. So keep on smiling. Because when you're smiling, the whole world smiles with you. You ready, Judy? I'll count you off. I want two, three, four. Mm. <laughs> You know, we needed that little uplift, and we needed to sing when you're smiling, the whole world smiles with you, because I have an apparent contradiction. I need your help. I've struggled more than a few times in my 45 years. Thank you. I've struggled with turning on my microphone. I have struggled more than a few times in my 45 years in unity. And I'm hoping today, with your many years of experience in life and in unity, you might help me. Now, there's no doubt we're all aware of what we, individually, what we as a church, what we as a nation and a world have gone through in the last year and a half. A lot of challenge, and people have suffered and had pain. Others have had far more trouble than I have had personally. 
because with your support, we were able to keep the church going. I was able, even in alignment with our governor's orders, to work here in the church through the whole pandemic and keep things running, even though we had to have our services online during that time. Well, my contradiction is this. I grew up in a church, and then when I was college age, for various reasons, I moved over to the Unity Church. Happened to be the big church in Houston, Texas. And I began to encounter people who said, all is well, all is in divine order in, every, in any and every situation. And although I believe to the depth of my being that that is the ultimate truth, the absolute truth, I also encountered times myself and with those near to me and with those I met in ministry who were struggling, in pain, knowing fear, meeting death in their life, death of loved ones. And I began to think that Lindy, all is well, all is in divine order, wasn't always helpful. And I thought, how do I practice this unity teaching in a, in a way that is true to my being? And I felt there was this contradiction in always smiling, always the positive mood, or being with someone who needed me to listen, to just be with them. This very week, a Unity minister friend of mine in another city called and told me that a friend, very close to her, but also a friend of mine, her cancer had returned and it had metastasized and it was now affecting her most extraordinary brain because she was a woman of great learning, great gifts. And my friend said, I'm at a loss of what to do. And I said, call her, be with her, spend time with her. Because it's a very human thing when a situation is uncomfortable, we back off. It's very common when someone loses a loved one that after the memorial service, the phone calls stop. I don't think it's out of cruelty. I think it's because people are uncomfortable. They don't know what to do. When I was in ministerial school, and it was my time to spend time in the hospital, sleep there overnight, be on call, try to support people in the health challenges that they were going through. And I was with a huge family, almost 40 people. The young mother in this family had died, but the hospital hadn't told the family. They kept her in the emergency room, waiting for the family to hopefully donate her organs. And this went on for hours. Finally, the medical staff talked to the family, explained the situation. Those who had to make the decision made the decision to donate her organs. And the matriarch of the family came to me and said, thank you. Thank me. I didn't really do anything. She said, you stayed with us for eight hours when the staff wasn't telling us what was happening, but you were with us. Man, she taught me a lesson I have never forgotten. I don't say that I necessarily practice it perfectly all the time, but I've never forgotten the power of presence, of simply being with someone. 
Maybe some of you are fixers like me or teachers like me. You want to give advice. You want to help. Let me fix it. Folks, that's not the secret. The secret is your presence with one who is suffering. A word we don't use a lot in unity, but really by definition, it simply means to experience. To suffer your life means to experience your life. Go through it completely. So here is this contradiction. Do we meet every situation with an affirmative statement that unity is so grounded in? All is well. Or are there times that we need to be with someone in the midst of their experience, perhaps with a statement more like, how can I help? A compassionate ear. Well, I'll give you an example that hurt me because it was my mother. When I was working at Unity Temple in Kansas City and I applied for the first time for ministerial training, notice that word, the first time, and I was redirected. It was Unity's word for you're not accepted. We've turned you down. No, we've redirected you. That positive approach. Well, my mother went to church services at Unity that first Sunday, and one of the older women, about my mother's age, who had been around Unity a long time, came up and said, oh, Wilde, I've, I've heard the news that James wasn't accepted. And my mother was still suffering, I think suffering more than me, with disappointment. And the woman said, now, Wilda, you remember, it's all in divine order, all is well. Well, I thought my mother was going to slug her. <laughs> she was so repulsed by not being recognized, by her feelings being discounted, that fortunately she just walked away rather than starting a brawl. But it was, it was a good lesson to me. Later when I did enter the third time around, Unity Ministerial School, one of our instructors often taught about metaphysical malpractice. And what she meant was to throw a truth statement, an affirmative phrase, at someone in the midst of their fear, their doubt, their suffering of any kind. Oh, Carlotta, get over it. Everything's wonderful. When she's lost a beloved pet, when she's just totaled her car out, oh, it's all in divine order. That may be true at the highest level, but did Jesus approach people that way, at least in the accounts we have recorded in the Gospels? It seemed to me he met people where they were, in their pain, in their suffering, in his day, even in their leprosy. He met them. He heard them. He did not discount their pain. But then in a gentle way, he said words that could slightly shift their attention toward the possible, toward the presence of spiritual power in their life. Sometimes, as our prayer chaplains even do, they hear someone's story they don't discuss it or give advice. They silently hold the truth of that individual in their heart and then build a prayer around that to say with this individual. Many scholars believed Jesus' miracle power 
in bringing forth healing was the fact that he could silently look to the very depths of the individual and as our daily word said today, see that their life begins and ends in reality is always in the heart of God. He could see the truth of the divine life within them and it brought forth on many occasions the healing of illness, the curing of blindness, and so many other things. We have to, I believe, speak to others in a manner in which they can understand. To speak with them in a way that they invite us to be in their presence. Someone gave me a gift this morning, earlier, said, I need calm. Pray with me. It's not a one-way street. The very fact that I was given a privilege to stand with someone, to support someone, was a blessing for us both. That's the secret that our prayer chaplains know so well. In the legend, now for something totally different, in the legend of Parseval, recorded in the 13th century by Wolfram von Eichenbach, he describes the, Gael, the Grail King, the king who possessed the sacred object associated with the passion of Jesus Christ. It had legendary healing power, prospering power. Yet the king had fallen ill, and the kingdom declined, and the land no longer produced food for the people. And all were suffering as the king was suffering. Parseval, the first time he encountered the king in the castle, kept quiet. He didn't want to seem too forward. It made me think maybe he was from Minnesota. <laughs> he, he didn't want to be too out there. So, as a result, nothing changed. Parseval ended up on a very long quest in his life until he was finally brought back to the Grail Castle. He encountered the suffering king and his most painful wound. And this time Parseval spoke. My king, what ails you? And suddenly, the power of the grail could work through Parseval's compassionate heart. And it brought forth not only the healing of the king, the healing of the land, and the people again began to prosper. But that power of the grail, that sacred object associated with Christ, that power began to flow through the compassionate act, not the cold declaration of an affirmation. Also, when I was in school, we had to study special services at Unity. So we went to the archives and we dug out old services, so say from the 20s and 30s. And I was given a funeral service to review and comment on how I thought it was structured and so forth. And so I started reading it to the class and I was shocked. A funeral service, you know what that means, lots of people, family, friends, people that know unity, people that don't, they all come together to remember the departed individual. And this service written by a rather famous unity individual began, we will not waste one more moment 
in useless grief. We will move straight to the absolute truth of life. And I gasp, thinking, what must those people that heard that half a century, what must they have felt? Well, I'm sure some of them were like, right on! But for others, in the midst of their grief and mourning for that individual, to be hit with that cold slap of ultimate truth may not have been comforting. It was not the legendary approach of the knight, Parsifal, who began, what ails you? Well, I'll bring this real close to home. You know what we've all been through in this church? And I've been th through things myself, coping with all of this. And just a few mo um, months ago, one person came to me and very intimately said, this must have been hard for you. It was the first time anyone had addressed what I might have been feeling through all these many months. Wondering what the future of our church was. Wondering what my future as a minister in this church was. And someone acknowledged my feelings. It was not unlike that far more famous story of the Holy Grail and Parsifal, one that's been interpreted through the centuries, probably the most famous, is the great opera by Wagner that speaks to these same issues. What ails you? How can I help? In our own time, Henry Nouwen characterized the wounded healer. And he wrote about keeping a balance between absolute truth and compassion. In his book, The Wounded Healer, now one recounts a story that was actually told long ago in the Talmud by, a rabbi, by rabbi Joshua ben Levi who asks Elijah the prophet when the Messiah will come. Elijah tells the rabbi to go himself and ask the Messiah who is sitting at the gates of the city. We might interpret the gates of the city as the edges of our awareness. When Rabbi Ben Levi asks how he will know the Messiah in the crowd at the gates of the city, Elijah replies, he is sitting among the poor, covered with wounds. All the others unbind all of their wounds at the same time. But he, the wounded healer, unbinds one wound at a time, saying to himself, perhaps I shall be needed to help another. So I must always be ready. In other words, he does not uncover all of his wounds at once, all of his vulnerabilities, just one at a time. So he's still capable of helping others. The others around him expose all their wounds and become so lost in their woundedness, they can't help anybody but not the wounded healer. And this wounded healer, by looking at one wound, acknowledges her pain, her vulnerability, so that she can compassionately listen to the circumstances of others. 
There's a wonderful gospel song I like. It has this line, keep my self-defenses shattered for easier access. It's a soul singing to the spirit. Keep me aware of my wounds so that I'm always teachable. I'm always approachable. I'm not living in complete certitude. Let's look at that word compassion. We can break it down very simply from its two roots. To suffer or experience with another. Come with another's passion, another's experience. Now notice it says with. It is not defined as enter into another's suffering. You know what that's like if you haven't done it yourself. I have. You've experienced with others. Colleen tells me about a bout of flu. Oh, oh yeah, let me tell you about the flu I had. It was awful. Entering into that suffering with another just drags you both down. Ain't it awful? I bet you've never been sick like I have. <laughs> All this. No, compassion is to be with another's passion or experience but not to be lost in it. An instructor in Unity Ministerial School was vulnerable enough to share his story of going to the hospital as a young minister to be with a family who had lost a loved one. He said, I was not aware of my wounds. I was not aware of my own grief. So I entered that hospital room with that family, saw the pain they were in, and he said, I immediately broke down and sobbed and sobbed until that family did their best to comfort him. A role reversal. The importance of being aware of what we have suffered in life so that we can be with others, but not lost in their pain. That, to me, is the essence of this ancient story of the wounded healer. Now, we could talk about many of the healing accounts of Jesus in the Gospels and watch the pattern of how he listened to others. He met them where they were, not in the high temple, but on the streets, in their villages. He listened. And then when it was appropriate, helpful and not hurtful, he spoke. Does no one condemn you? Then neither do I. Go your way and don't make the same mistake again. Go to the temple and give an offering of thanks and tell what God has done for you today in your healing. Take up your mat and walk. And in many cases of death, Jesus simply declared, come forth. Come forth. Jesus modeled this proclamation of truth, but through an act of compassion, through a compassionate heart. Well, before we take a moment in meditation, I 
gosh, I had several more good stories. <laughs> but I'll cut to the chase. A verse I like in a song that the whole world sings. It's a very rare second verse, very rarely performed to somewhere over the rainbow. And I invite you to listen to its message. Once by a word only lightly spoken, all your dreams are broken for a while. Sadness comes and joy goes by. But every tear like the rain descending finds a happy ending in a smile. Doubts and fears all fade and die. To the blue beyond the gray, love again will find its way somewhere over the rainbow. By the means of compassion, the fundamental truths of life will speak. But I believe we have to buffer their power and harshness by speaking them through a heart that loves, a heart that acknowledges where another person may be before we lay the truth on them. So I invite you to join me with a moment, a moment in the silence. And we'll have to do this quickly, but that does not diminish its power. I invite you to close your eyes, to rest in the silence, to be still, calm, to acknowledge the presence of your God, your source, your creator. Just ask yourself, God is always and everywhere present or not. What is my faith? I believe God is here now with me. You may choose to imagine the faith of a great spiritual leader whom you admire. Jesus Christ, another spiritual leader, someone in our world that models compassion, charity, love. Hold that image for a moment. Realize you are safe and protected in this inner sanctuary. Now behold a wound, a circumstance of suffering. It can be your own story or the story of someone you care for. Ask yourself those powerful questions. What troubles you? Respond, I care. You matter to me. Rest with this for a while. And then draw the image of another into the inner scene of your mind's eye, someone you don't understand, someone you disagree with, someone perhaps you have hard feelings against. But let them enter this warm light of compassion you have created within. Just hold them in that light of love. It may take effort, but you can do it. Perhaps you'll hear that beautiful verse again. Love again will find the way. Healing will restore. Faith in the good can be reclaimed. We can go over that rainbow. 
which is to grasp God's promise of the good yet to be. We do this as we travel the road of compassion. And so I invite you to gently allow your attention to return to this time, this place, where we're seated with friends, friends who care. And as you're ready, open your eyes. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God for the great heart in which, as our daily word said, we all begin and end in the great heart of God. Thank you for being here, for lending your ear and letting me to invite you into this apparent contradiction. I think we made a little progress today. There'll still be challenges ahead, but we can meet them as we help one another. Jim, let's kick it up a notch with some music. <laughs> Well, y'all remember the little Sunday school song that this song starts with? It's uh, Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Why? Because everything is beautiful and everyone is beautiful. Thank uh-huh. you.
Well, thank you, and everything is beautiful. We are grateful, and in the interest of time, you all know what to do. So together, let us say our offering blessing. Divine love flowing through me blesses and multiplies all the good that I am and have all the good that I give and receive, and I am grateful. And now, Reverend Stacy. Well, good news. I'm canceling your homework <laughs> for today. However, I do encourage you to exercise your compassionate heart this week. You can do it by observing others. You don't have to intervene or necessarily talk to them. But observe what people are going through and say, I see the good and the truth in you, even though you may not see it at this moment. It is there. So let us stand now and seal our service with prayer for protection. The light of God surrounds us. The love of God enfolds us. The power of God protects us. The presence of God watches over us. Wherever we are, God is. And so it is. Now, again for the first time in a year and a half, there are goodies downstairs. Go spend some time with one another, enjoy some refreshment, and enjoy one another's company. Mm -hmm.